I think a lot of Dubliners don't realise the stories behind the streets they walk down every day. For instance, this is Marsh's library, one of the oldest libraries in Europe. So if you'd like to stick with me, we'll have a little ramble and a gander at some historic sites. One historic site, visited by a historic character, is St. Patrick's Cathedral in the Liberties. When Oliver Cromwell led his 13,000 soldiers through Dublin, he rode on horseback into the church and let his horse drink from the baptismal font. No respect. In later years, the cathedral was run by Dean Swift. Jonathan Swift, to you. The man who wrote Gulliver's Travels. When the Normans took over the running of the place from the Vikings back in the 12th century, they built a massive wall around the town. This is part of that original wall. And that wall set Dublin apart from the rest of the country. It was from Dublin Castle, built on the edge of the original medieval town, that Dubliners were ruled. In those days, Dublin was a fairly small affair. And for hundreds of years, it suffered plagues and sieges and the like. In the early 17th century, Dublin still only had a population of 10,000. But by the end of that century, thanks to the arrival of Jewish, Dutch and other immigrants and the build-up of commerce, it reached 60,000. In the 18th century, the real splendour of Dublin started to take shape. This building, for almost 200 years now, the Bank of Ireland, was built as the Irish House of Parliament. It was built in four stages by four architects, and when it became a bank, they installed cannons sentries to mind a few bob inside. And then there's Trinity College, Ireland's most famous seat of learning. It was established in 1592 by Queen Elizabeth, and the statues of Scholar Burke and Playwright Goldsmith have looked down on its visitors for centuries. Such great people as Wolf Tone, Oscar Wilde and Samuel Beckett studied here. It was originally set up only for members of the Church of Ireland, but in these ecumenical days, it's open to all comers. In Trinity's old library, you'll find this gem, the Book of Kells. This is not the real one, of course. They keep the real one here on the glass. No one even knows what monks and what monastery put their sweat and eyesight into writing this book back in 800 AD. But it was kept in Kells, County Meath, until it was brought to Dublin in the 17th century. The pages are made from the hides of calves, and the colours are made from plants and flowers from all over the world. There's even a particular shade that comes from the belly of an African insect. The gorgeous work has 680 pages and illustrates the four Gospels written in Latin. It must be one of the world's finest pieces of religious art. Wouldn't art and the old buildings give you a terrible thirst? Whether we like it or not, the drink has played a big part in the Dublin way of going. If you haven't the price of a pint, there's a great measure of how you are fixed. And the Dubliners were very fond of the gargle, so there's nothing like it. And I took a great frequenter of Dublin pubs. Flann O'Brien, to write what amounts to a homage to the Gargan. When things go wrong and will not come right, though you do the best you can. When life looks black as the dark of night, the point of playing is your only man. Well, when money is tight, it's hard to get, and your horse is also ran, and all you've left is a heap of death. The point of playing is your only man. When health is bad and your heart feels strange and your face is pale and wan, when doctors say that you need a change, the point of playing is your only man. When food is scarce and your lard are bare and no rashers grease your pan, when hunger grows and your meals are rare, a point of playing is your only man. In times of trouble and lousy strife, you've still got a darling plan. You still can turn to a brighter life. A point of plan is your only man. Ah. 
But you can't spend all your time enjoying yourself. And in the city, there's always work to be done. Dublin was a merchant city, and the River Liffey was its life's blood. Dubliners weren't work shy, and commerce blossomed. By the end of the 18th century, with a population of 150,000, it was one of the largest cities in Europe, and the second city of the British Empire. In the heyday of George and Dublin, the gentry were making a stack, and they lived in dignified splendour, with their servants downstairs in the basements, and themselves upstairs, lording it over Dublin society. Dublin to this day boasts some of the finest examples of Georgian architecture. The fan lights and the red brick of Merrion Square and Fitzwilliam Square are a glory. But Dublin is a curio. It was left out of the race for growth and importance after the 1798 rebellion, when there were fears in England that it was getting too powerful. Caught between being the capital of the land of saints and scholars and being an outpost of the British Empire, it then bore the brunt of changes in the 20th century. While thousands of Dubliners were off fighting for king and country on the green and bloody fields of Flanders and the Somme, Dublin was the scene of the 1916 Easter Rising. That rebellion eventually led to the forming of the Irish Free State, with Dublin as its capital. But the birth of the Republic was a painful one. A civil war followed, with Irishmen turned against Irishmen, and the city, an innocent bystander, being battered by the struggle. Finally, after 700 years of English rule, and with all the landmarks of the Empire still around it, the last British soldiers left, and the city and its people had a kind of crisis of identity. In the 1930s, Dublin was, as the poet Louis McNeese put it, a town with porter running from the taps with a head of yellow cream, and Nelson on his pillar watching his world collapse. Up until that time, Dubliners were a very tight-knit community in the city. They were the people Sean O'Casey immortalised in plays like Juno and the Paycock and The Plough and the Stars. But the city centre grew tired, and once elegant Georgian townhouses fell into decay as tenements. These grand old houses might have teemed with life, but they also teemed with rats and filth. The romance of staying with the people you'd grown up with for generations was hard to forget, though. And Dubliners were horrified when it was announced that the corporation would move them out to two up, two down houses in far away suburbs. They couldn't bear to face the prospect of being shifted out beyond the pale, where Brendan Bean's father claimed they ate their young. So prejudiced were Dubliners about life in the country that they had bloodthirsty ballads about all kinds of goings on in the wilds outside the city. And one such penny dreadful kind of song is still a Dublin favourite.